Hello, everyone. It's a delight and an honor to be here in Rochester, New York, here at NTID. It's a tremendous honor. I feel great to be here. Thank you to Patty Durr. We met many years ago. I've been here before to discuss research relative to deaf artwork in France and Europe and here in America and trying to compare the two and to connect the history. So thank you to Patty. I've been here previously, so I'm here again. So it's a tremendous honor. And just so you know, I just want to clarify and introduce who I am. I'm not that great at fingerspelling. Obviously, I'm going to sign in French, but I will fingerspell very slowly. For those who are deafblind, I want to respect your needs. For those that are from other countries, I thank you for coming. I'm going to try to do this in a very methodical, slow manner in fingerspelling. So I have some PowerPoint slides to show. We have different colors to identify. Blue for a deaf artist or deaf author. Yellow is a hearing artist or author. So blue for deaf, yellow for hearing. In summary, this is my name sign for Olivier. I used to be involved with theater for 30 some odd years. I've been a part of the IVT, the International Visual Theater Group. I've been a part of the deaf community. I've done research both near and far, and that can be challenging, both being a part of the group and outside of the group, and me as a deaf individual being inside and out. And IVT really has served an important role for culture, deaf culture, for deaf artists to really grow their work and their influence and, and really looking at the history prior to the founding of the IVT and, and actually how IVT was established. We will discuss all the history leading up to its establishment and how we got to the point of IVT being uh, founded and begin to grow. We'll look at the identity, the strengths, weaknesses, and all that information. We'll go into detail. So the Milan conference in Italy, everybody's familiar with that. You know what happened at the conference, but we'll talk about what happened leading up to the conference and after that. And we will look in greater detail at the timeline. Now, you know, a lot of people have done research, especially with education. The schools, the residential deaf schools, deaf education, and the research about deaf education. And deaf education, in terms of what did they do after graduating, what type of blue-collar work, whether that be in agriculture, farming, uh, the various trades, construction, mechanical, the vocational trades. So you know that there's that educational aspect. But the research hasn't really been done uh, in the other areas, in that area, uh, with regards to the videography and the artwork. But they've certainly researched the educational side of things. We certainly have the signing uh, manual method and then the oral method. We don't know about those who are involved with that oral method in terms of the research for that, but we're going to look at some of that. We're not going to look at the educational side, but outside of the education. You've got the schools where the oral method was being utilized in some schools and the manual signing method in others, and we've got research on the signing method in some schools and research on the oral method in other schools. Both of these simultaneously. This is from 1880, that time frame. And here's what's important to note. Deaf people thought this was a law, but in reality, this was not passed into law. At the Milan conference, people discussed and they agreed to disseminate what they had decided upon. And in Paris, you had a lot of deaf people there. And then the next major conference, obviously, you know, in Italy, in Milan, a lot of people from Paris could not travel because of the long distance. And people from Gallaudet could not go and discuss the language issue where they began to reject the signing method. And the oral method came up. And as far as the people discussing that issue, a lot of people who did not attend the conference, they supported the signing method. And they were not able to be a part of the discussion. We'll showcase some of this information. Justine Code, make sure you remember that. Remember uh, during the medieval times, this was a law. 
those who worked in the fields, farming, agriculture, was one group with a different philosophy from those who were in the cities, in the urban areas, with a different philosophy. They were educated. Those that were in the fields working and farming did not have edu education, and they were signing. Those who were in the urban areas in the city, they were speaking. They didn't sign. And in order to have the inheritance from the family, they had to speak. That was the law. If they could not speak, they could not inherit the family business or money or inheritance. So therefore, a lot of wealthy, well-to-do families needed to keep passing on their family wealth. They needed to train their children to be able to speak. That was in France. That was their mindset. Their mindset was that deaf people could not. You could not become a citizen if you did not speak verbally. And citizenship was so important. It's still an issue even today. You know who Alexander Graham Bell is, of course. Um, prior to the Milan Conference, there was a lot of research he did. You know, they said the oral method's going to be good. It's going to be great. And he supported the oral method. So America influenced France in that regard. As far as the schools, you had a school, it's INJS, it's the National Institute for Deaf Children School in Paris. It's the, you know, it was the first oral school that was established. Again, it was a parochial school, Catholic, a strong Catholic religious influence that was heavily focused on the oral method. As far as the new students that wanted to come, they had, they could not sign. They had to use the oral method. And, of course, they would reject the signing method. And that began to grow an influence in France. And then, obviously, even strong deaf people. One person by the name of Claudius. How do you spell the last name? Pfister. As far as getting money, you know, this was a last signing school. And then money ran out. As far as education, you had people that were heavily involved in their religion, the nuns. They were teaching the oral method. And as they tried to teach the deaf children, they could not catch on. They couldn't understand the oral method. Then they would pivot and move over to the signing method. So I have two examples, two pieces of artwork I want to highlight. And again, that conference, the Milan Conference in 1880, what happened shortly thereafter? You know, the devia, the artwork, the deaf identity, that's clear. But back in the day, they didn't have that. So how did they show artwork? It was really considered taboo at that time. It was kind of secretive. It was not allowed out and open. Here, this deaf school has this large piece of artwork that's framed. This is a teacher there who's an artist, a hearing individual, who did this piece of artwork. You notice it's in yellow. It's Burgess. This person's uh, hearing individual, they're fluent sign language, an artist. Uh, we don't know if they use the signing method or the oral method, but this is a hearing teacher that did this particular artwork. And obviously, they you can see that this person supported the signing manual method. Notice the light and then the signs, the gestures. You see the, uh, the epe. You see the picture of this. You see the huge impact upon the hearing population. I thought this was a deaf artist. I was shocked to find out this was a hearing artist. So we're thankful to this person. This particular person, Burgess, was a um, Felix IV, president of France, visited this the school and published in the news that here's these individuals signing and they're acting like animals with the signing method, a very discriminatory. discriminatory. Uh, and, and in defiance of that, they still showcase this artwork. Do you know this particular artwork? The Deaf School? I saw this particular artwork. I took a picture of this original. There's other pictures that were not very clear. So this is a high quality photograph. You can see the name of the artist at the bottom. Berthaire, this is the sign name P on the side of the chest. Berthaire is a teacher and artist. And again, 
why the P on the side of the chest is because they would actually pin something to the chest in honor. This individual since has died. Or Robin. Do you see this, the snake? Now, obviously, this has a religious connotation to it. It's a mask. They've got a hood. And you see the Grim Reaper, Mr. Death, if you will. That's the equation the equation to the oral method, right? Very strong connotation to all this, the philosophical implications of the artwork, the mask, the snake, the religious connotation, the Grim Reaper. You see the blue name? That means this individual was a deaf person. The previous one was yellow, uh, red. No, no, it was yellow. It means it was a hearing person. It was a hearing individual. This is very sensitive work, just like a black person and the black issues and the history. There are some political issues there and sensitive issues. So this individual, again, Felix Martin, this person's deaf. This individual came to America. Previously, this individual was a slave, the first one in England. 1833. 1833. This person was in the UK. Is when they abolished slavery in France. It was 1881, I think. 1881, when they outlawed slavery. And then in America, it was years later, in 85. So you can see that America still continued with that slavery. So this person did this particular sculptor and artwork. And again, the French government did not ask them to do this. This person did this on their own. And of course, there's a metaphor to this, a deaf individual and their uh, connection to slavery and, and, and with the black population. Now, you see the dog. You see the dog that's actually trying to bite the throat or the neck. And it's almost like a, a, even a monkey that's biting. So me, Felix, I'm the individual, the artist. I feel similar to this artwork. And so I'm doing that type of work to showcase my feelings. So again, this was originally not showcased in the museum. It was hidden away in the base basement of museums because of racism against black people and, and the sensitive issues. So they hid it away. And it was back 2007 when they finally put it out and showcased it to show this is a deaf artist, a famous individual. People all over France recognize this. The French government purchased this and wanted this particular piece of work. And they wanted to show because of this person being deaf as well as uh, a well-known artist. So again, with the sculpture, it's just like with hearing individuals, hearing artists. They have well-known, famous individuals. They, they may be involved in something and they could be heavily involved and honored and revered in the black community and recognized for their work. This person is deaf. And I can certainly relate to this individual. I really enjoy this one. Just like the black people and black community really uh, respects this individual, an artist. So now this next thing I want to discuss is uh, two different uh, pivot points. Um, the artwork that has an impact and the artwork that does not have an impact. You can see this for yourself. There's two or three different ones on the screen. All three of those were done by deaf individuals, deaf artists. The very first one you see that's highlighted in yellow, the very first one is a hearing individual. Do you know who that is? Very famous person. This person's sign name is they're, they're crippled with their right foot. They're constantly walking with a limp with the right foot. That's their sign name. This person's close friends, it's Prince Su, Prince Su. And these individuals are very close friends. This was an educator, a deaf person, working in education to help others succeed. They're sitting around the table, chatting, having conversations. See the one on the right? You see D.F.A. And why do you see that? People are obviously honoring this individual because of sign language and modeling sign language and how powerful that that is. You know, deaf people are saying, look, look at all the hearing people. They get all the attention, the spotlight. What about the deaf individuals? And Berthere that I mentioned earlier, uh, the deaf artist working on uh, a deaf uh, face of an individual in his artwork. So you got artwork for the hearing, artwork for the deaf. And again, they're tr we're trying to just 
take bits and pieces of different pieces of artwork. I can't showcase everything. I'm just selecting because of time. Now look at towards the bottom, this individual, they got close to dying. They completed this particular piece of artwork. And then, of course, they honored this individual. Again, it's not the hearing, but it's the deaf that they're they're honoring and they're trying to support. And even with the epee, we're trying to honor the artwork. Pierre Deslodge. This is a first person who's really heavily involved in politics and writing. Now read this text. So signing is so important for the community. It is recognized in the deaf community. And as far as deaf people writing in terms of history, uh, Katian, a person from a deaf family, wrote and did a lot of research and publications. And Katian, this person, their parents and grandparents, again, were deaf individuals, several generations of deaf people. This person was not involved in the schools, but rather just in everyday life and observing. So not involved in the school setting, but in the community setting. And again, you'll see Kation here. The Milan conference, was that a good conference? They were against sign language. So he wanted to know what's the impact on the deaf community. Uh, as a result of that, they established in the deaf community sports organizations and so forth. And will the artwork have a positive or a negative impact on the community? We don't know. We'll have to research that. You're here today. Obviously, it had a positive impact. In the 1800s, Again, we're looking at that time frame. As far as the deaf artwork, there really wasn't a major impact. Just as I stated earlier, this individual came from a multi-generation of deaf individuals, I believe six generations in his family. Husbands, wives were able to find employment and work. And they did research on this. This person married a woman. He did research, and she did research. They both worked together in tandem as a team. Now, you can see this. This is 1880. Really, from 1830 to 1880, you had a lot of deaf artists that were publicizing, doing the work. And then at the Milan Conference there was a major decline. They began to reject a lot of the artwork. And then they began, the deaf community focused on sports and publicizing and writing. And the artwork went, was in major decline. So in my own personal research, in looking at this information, really 279, I believe it's 279 artists is what we had out in the community. Now, we've got a long list of names of those individuals, and we'll show that in subsequent slides. But so, just so you know that the art community, you probably had more than 40 wealthy artist elite individuals that had money and families that would support those artists. You know, the paintings and the artwork are very, very expensive pieces of work, right? And so if you paint something that would be showcased in the house or put in a gallery, you would have to pay for that artwork. So a very, very expensive type of work, which means you had to have the elite of society to be able to pay for that. And some, they would support these individuals and artists in their work, and they would reject the deaf. They also uh, rejected female artists. Obviously, it was a uh, male-dominated society back then, so I apologize, but society has changed today. The medieval time period, uh, Da Vinci, right? You ha had a deaf artist that worked with him. This person did a lot of great work. So four years worth of research, and finally they publicized the fact that this Italian individual, uh, they, they didn't print it or translate it into other languages, but it's in Italian. But there's this particular book. It's been publicized. You got to look this book up. You need to f get this resource. Uh, one particular student, uh, Goyina, from Spain, there, there could be, uh, we don't know if it's a hearing individual or a deaf individual. Um, it doesn't denote if it's a hearing or a deaf person. It just mentions the name, so we're not sure. And then the sign for birthday, 
you should be a familiar with this, with France and America working together. Uh, we'll talk about that relationship between, the strong relationship between France and, and America. Uh, tendon is the sign for birthday. Birthday is sign for tendon. Is uh, This individual would go to uh, France on a regular basis, and the, the, the press, if you will, the elite, would invite this individual And another individual by the name of Chopin would teach tendon and work with metal and how to melt it down, how to reshape it, and how to work with that metal. See the first one? Pierre Pellissier. Gelliar. This person is signs, uh, married a deaf person, very strong, strongly involved in the deaf organization. Then you had Berthier, you had Copen, and then you, many of these, you know, most of these are going to be male. Just like in America, back in that time period, it was focused on the men until women's rights, until eventually equality. But it's the same idea in France. Among the hearing community and the deaf community, as far as the history, you see a, a very similar parallel. First, you would have the hearing community make progress, and then the deaf community would be behind. You can see these photographs. You had a committee of artists that were picking and choosing some of the artwork, and they would exclude the work of the deaf artist. It's shameful, but they had a list of criteria, rules to follow. And so another group would uh, be established to say, we want to follow the same criteria for the hearing artwork. You had Felix. You did not have tendon at this time. It was before. It wasn't before. It wasn't after. You see the sculptures that they establish. They would often look at the hearing sculptures and artwork by the hearing artist. And this was a international event. And they would look at all the sculptures done by hearing artists here. And they would work with steel, metal, marble, many different types of artwork and shapes and so forth. See Hamar, this individual. Well, you, you had a lot of these established in France, the various sculptures in France. And then Tendon, just like what we have here, well, then you have Hamar, the same thing in France. And Hamar, this individual, will showcase this. So you can see the angel. Why is this so important? Oh, now you see the Statue of Liberty being brought to America. And the deaf in France and America, we had a strong relationship just like the two countries. And the, art, the shared work going back between the two. And why the sculpture? Why the Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty? And you can see within this, you see the deaf Americans and the uh, deaf uh, Frenchmen. You can see the inspiration by the French. And Amer Americans would go to France to learn various artwork, and you can see the sharing of knowledge and information. In Chicago, you had the World Expo, the World Fair. You had a lot of Frenchmen that would travel to Chicago, and this individual, the sign name is on the top of the forehead. I don't know his name. And another person, uh, what's the artist? Uh, what's that deaf artist I'm thinking of? Sign name is on top of the, the forehead. What's the sign name of this person? Redmond? Uh, do you know the sign name for Redmond? I don't know. This is our sign name for Redmond. Well, this person came to, to become roommates with an individual during that conference, so that was nice. Again, this is done by hearing sculpturist. Notice the precision in the artwork. And they gave this person an honor, an award, this hearing artist, the, the school that they have. They've got a small trophy or an award. We have a larger one. Boxer. Uh, Chopin was teaching Tendon how to work with the metal to melt it down, purify it, and then begin to work with it and, and taught Tendon how to do that. And then the next one, now you know this one, you know, that of a bear that is biting compared to the previous one where the dog was biting the neck while the bear was biting 
the arm. This is a Native American. You can see, obviously, the, the stabbing of the, the knife. You can see the interesting history behind this. You can see the minority group, the Native Americans and the black com community. And you have their artists and their artists. And during this time period, you can see a lot of similarities, which is really fascinating. So the people in the community, how do you screen and pick and choose the various artists? Some did their artwork as a career and a profession. Others more as a hobby. Those worked in, in art as a full-time job. Others were farmers, carpenters, woodworkers. Various type of vocational trades would then utilize art as part of their hobby. Others, it was part of their profession. Some would work with mar marble, wood, steel. Uh, there's really not a lot of wood uh, artwork that was highlighted. There were some that would say you could come and become part of the group, but most of the time it was to the exclusion of others. If you were a poor farmer or working in the farm, they would not spend the money on your work because you know it's not cheap. Those who are wealthy could afford it. Those who are not wealthy could not afford it, so therefore they excluded uh, the poor artist. Tendon uh, was really an important individual was involved in numerous groups. The elite artist gave much recognition for Tendon's work and certainly recognized him as such. And he kept saying, you've got to support the signing community. And the hearing artist would just look and say, okay, we'll make note of that. But he kept saying, you've got to support the signing community. This person's sign name, Letter F on the right, underneath the right eye. This is the sign name. Here's how you fingerspell the name. Tendon would actually teach the office. So Tendon would learn from, a, from his mentor and then would pass it on. This person was gay. And of course, this was taboo at the time. And obviously, you know... It, it was all about men. You'd have some ladies that were real stocky and strong, but that's an issue that was discussed back then. This is another piece of artwork. I like this particular piece. A deaf individual doing a piece of artwork about the oral method, which is really quite fascinating. This person would work and on commission. Whether or not they supported the oral method, we don't know. So it, it didn't matter if it was the signing, the oral method, but they work on commission. So it's interesting here. Mynir, and this person's sign name, was uh, strongly uh, Catholic, religious, and oral. And this was during the... Were, French Revolution and this particular sculpture and artwork, some would veer to the left or right, whether it be the identity of the oral sign, oral method or the signing method. So you had two different identities. The person who's crippled, that's her sign name. This is the painting for this individual about a deaf individual. This really is heart-wrenching, speaks to the heart. This individual loves to ride horses, did numerous pieces of artwork and paintings relative to horses and knew quite a bit about the horses and was very talented in portraying a horse. Moving on down, let me go further regarding the theatrical side of things. So we've discussed the past, the educational group. Now we're going to talk about theatrical and the epe. Remember the dumb, the, the deaf blind, the hearing were viewed as smart. You know, if you were blind, you're, you were considered more intelligent than the deaf at that time because they could speak and the deaf couldn't. You know, the hearing perspective was deaf people, they're dumb, they're mute, they can't speak, plus they're dumb intellectually. But the blind are smart because they can speak. Now, are you aware of this? Are you familiar with this? This is very important. This individual who wrote this, Borelli, this author, wrote numerous pieces relative to theater, 
To our surprise, we finally found one with a lot of information regarding this individual. So again, Borrelli did a lot of writing relative to the theatrical side of things. And this is, you know, over a hundred year period. You can see a similar theme. And again, it's the time period. Milan Conference would forbid the signing, but the EPE would continue. Those within deaf education though, would not support it. Those in the deaf community would support the signing method. Again, the difference between the deaf education and the deaf community, those in the community would support the signing method. Again, we had numerous types of theatrical performances all over. Typically, theatrical performances were run by hearing people, just like today. You know, when you do hashtag deaf skills, well, it's the same issue back then as we what we face today. Some of them were gesturing. They were not signing. They were gesturing and acting out. They were not speaking as well, but they were just gesturing. How would they do that? So deaf people would teach and train. Uh, Berthair and some of the other individuals, uh, Gilliard and others, would teach the hearing actors and actresses and say, no, that's not right. You need to change this. You need to gesture this or that way. But the acting was very, very simple. Uh, deaf people would then obviously succeed in teaching in this regard. And again, Berthair, you know, assigned or whatever, they would say, oh, no, no, that's an old sign. You need to change this. This other individual uh, would say, well, if it's going to be a deaf performance, deaf people need to be involved. You know, that hashtag deaf skills, it's the same idea. It's the same problem. Nothing has changed throughout the centuries. Hearing people taking over the roles of deaf people. Again, this is the Milan Conference where they prohibited signing. Now, again, in the sporting events, that was a strong signing uh, community. And as well as the theatrical, you had a lot of ladies involved in the sports, running, swimming, dancing. A lot of females involved. As a result of that, obviously, dancing was a big issue because ladies, maybe they'd be uh, curvaceous or uh, and people would say, how do you know how to dance? How do deaf people know how to dance? And of course, they would think, well, you know, dancing, you know, is no big deal. But there's a strong correlation between sports and dancing. It's kind of their first sporting event is actual dance. Uh, things such as ballet. And then when they were done with a sporting event, they would eat, you know, after the games are done, they would have a dance. You know, again, when the sporting event is over late at night, they'd have a dance. So you'd see that strong correlation. And those who would actually write, they would actually participate in the sports when that's done. Then they would write the results. They write down this person, Elise, this person was a strong believer in feminism. This was a feminist. Again, they would eat and Berthair would get involved and Berthair was very knowledgeable of this, but as far as communication, how would they do that? Who would they choose? They'd have the first interpreter. This is the first interpreter. This sign name to the left and right of the nose. The person's name is Mongloff. This is their sign name. And they would compare America and France. And as far as labeling the community, you know, they would call this my brother. My brother's my brother, just like in France. You know, at that time, during Napoleon's time, during the French Republic. And so I'm picking and choosing some of the words. And I'm putting this, this is my brother. You can see this is my nation. You can see the flag, the pride in my nation. Now you can see the flag here, the, the deaf artist that created the deaf flag. Same idea. Do you remember Vedits? And I'm just comparing Vedits with Berthair, just like my brother. Vedits would say, my community or my people of the eye. It's that same idea. My brother versus my people of the eye. Deaf people had that strong connection to their deaf identity. So the next uh, performance, you would have an organization, 
a theatrical organization that would then come into the schools. And, and, you know, if you're familiar with the dormitories or the residential schools, what would they do at night to keep themselves busy? They would have little makeshift performances at night in the dormitories. And this individual, this Barun, the sign name is Barun, and again, a very old individual and uh, someone from seven generations, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, till finally this individual is the last one in theatrical. But in writing, uh, plays and performing and uh, deaf themes, uh, it's not only just for deaf, but it was it was also for comedic purposes. It didn't have to be deaf related in terms of the theme, but for comedy as well. So everyone could enjoy it. And this photograph, I was able to find it and I cherish this photograph. You see the last female that's here, Macon. Again, this is a female, a very well-known dancer, very talented. A lot of deaf people, the IVT that was established. This is right before that. Some of the theatrical and eh, deaf people were not really involved in the dancing. They were just there for the more social event and just to travel and meet people. But they didn't really dance as much, not so much. Uh, some people might dance a little bit. Some deaf people knew how to dance and move and uh, ballroom dancing. This person got heavily involved in the political side of things and advocacy and the civics and supporting the citizens and got involved as a teacher and as a dancer. Uh, this is a symbol, really, to the international community. And I've actually met this person. This individual is actually 94 years of age. 94 years of age. First time I met this individual. And this person said they had never had a deaf individual researcher, reporter, ask me any questions. You talk about a moving experience for this person. This person has that old-fashioned signing. We were able to videotape this, so I cherish that interview. It really was a heart-moving experience. My hat's off in recognition to this woman of tremendous strength. Here's the first deaf movie in France, Thierry Bilby. Started with it much excitement and fanfare, but really ended up dissipating and not much attention to it. In 1970, that's a very important time in history. You know the influence of deaf power, uh, the revolution, the feminist movement, uh, the gay movement, a lot of those different types of civil rights movement, even in France as well, 1970. And if you're familiar with Stokey, William Stokey. I'm sure you know that. The recognition where he publicly recognized sign language as real language. So France was able to influence America and vice versa. The people in France would come to Stokey and learn that you've got a PhD in this and, and deaf, you know, and, and ASL. And so they would go back to France and we owe a debt of gratitude to America. Same is true for people in Sweden. And just so that you know, this phrase, deaf mute, that was a phrase used in the past. Uh, and, you know, they just became deaf or hard of hearing or hearing impaired. But the French word is different. And it's mal. It means bad. Mal means bad. And then deaf half, deaf half. And now this is a sign for this. Because it's more of a, a audiological view. It's that negative connotation. And those are, those are some of the mixed feelings. Again, this is the strong influence from the medical community. Deaf people say, I'm fine. I can't hear, but I'm fine. I can do anything else. But this is the sign that they'll use. And then now you see here, Gallaudet, you've got the group of people that are involved there. So again, from the 1970s, you got people from France coming to learn here in the States, getting involved and really observing how do you train and then how do you teach that. And then they went back to France and got busy. They established organizations, continued to grow some of their schools. So really from the 1970s, you saw a tremendous incline and in growth among the deaf organizations that were established all over. And then the writing and the signing, and then, of course, the bilingual, bicultural approach and the strong advocacy for have, being bilingual. When you look at the political side of things where they tried to uh, prohibit signing, but wanting to have official recognition of sign language on the governmental level, that was part of their goals. 
and the advocacy and the pushing for that, just like with the theatrical and trying to encourage the growth there and, and those that would use the white gloves in the theatrical realm, uh, some would use a mask, the orals, the oral individuals would use a mask. And then they would take the parallel and push for things relative to the political recognition of things. You'll see that within the IVT theatrical group. So I want the deaf people to really ha show some gratitude to Gallaudet because without Gallaudet, would France continue on like it has? We really don't know. Minqui, Minqui, a deaf individual. Uh, Minqui, again, this is a deaf author who wrote various books in defense of sign language. Now, the next one, this artist, you, you know, when you're s signing very slowly and you pour a little oil on it, you can sign more fluid, just like a tin man needs oil to become more fluid in its motion. It's the same idea. That's the metaphor behind this. Americans love this individual. Very, very visual. A lot of photographs, very iconic photographs and photographer. And this person, they said, could you get up and, and come on over here and do your artwork? We'll pay for you to come. And of course, this person had much success and we thank America. This is the deaf school at the bottom. You see Gallaudet at the top and you can see the relationship between the two different schools. You see the sculpture work in the 1800s, 1880s. You can see the connection through that timeline, the history, Gallaudet and France and America. And we come to America to say thank you for your influence. Wow, this is a powerful piece to highlight. Maltz. So you had Guy, the previous individual, really supporting artists and really envisioned that, hey, you could succeed. This sign name for this individual, Toreg, was trying to establish a deaf home for individuals. So here, and of course, you can see the picture of deaf infants that were rejected as they're just kind of walking and wandering. That's kind of the idea, just like the Native American community. Uh, do they have any, just like the deaf people, they were just wandering around. The Native Americans have sign language as well. But here's the different pictures to highlight some of this. You can see the one that's in the middle. You see the signing. Uh, even in Egypt, where they were slaughtering the babies, throwing them in the river and drowning them. You can see the different pictures here. Now, again, we arrive to the point of the IVT. Again, the IVT, Colorado. This sign name is Colorado. It was a partnership between the hearing and the deaf. Again, a partnership between the deaf. A hearing person that knew English followed the theatrical side of things. And then, of course, the, the suit and tie culture in France and then eventually a change. Just like the peace, love, rock and roll movement here in America, you saw a lot of the change in the culture. 1970s, the hippie movement. Well, that's what you had in America as well as in France. The teachers, the philosophy at the time, uh, their philosophy was you had to be uh, very, very formal and, and in your signing. Well, now it's more improv and uh, and so forth on the spot. And this is the influence. They would just sign and they, wow, they just fell in love with this. And of course, Americans, just like the uh, puppets, that famous cartoon or the use of puppets, the French would see that and say, oh, that's great. Well, they, they got this involved uh, in terms of the French children. And again, uh, Coronado Alfonso, this person didn't really see this. What would they do? They would see a lot of families uh, with a strong oral method. Parents could not sign. And so Alfonso said, no, no, we're going we're gonna to focus on the adults instead of the children. Uh, because if they're oral, they're not going to sign. Let's teach the adults. And came, come to find out that a lot of deaf people didn't know about the deaf artist and their performances. We thought, do I need to teach everyone about our culture and our identity? And so uh, reluctantly decided to put aside the theatrical and decided to focus on teaching the culture and identity of the deaf community. 
So really doing a personal self-analysis, unpacking my identity, uh, just like those, you know, who have experience in the, the mind and heart, you know, how, you know, just in IVT, there's that emotional point. You go through that personal self-discovery and journey of who I am. So there's three important things. You'll notice the first one. It's in the brackets. And then the brackets that are flipped, inverted, you see it's times or by 180. You see the one on the bottom? I met this individual, a hearing individual. They they didn't want their, their name there. So it's in the bracket. That means we're together. Hearing people are not included. It's just the deaf. That's inside the brackets. We go through our deaf problems. We unpack our, our issues and we find out who we are. Look at our, uh, our pictures and photographs. We didn't have any movies at the time. Now, the next one, you'll see some pictures. They share the pictures. We're not sure which is which. We're not sure who the artist is, who took the photograph. Some people are older. They have forgotten. Is it this one? Uh, is it, you know, times eight? Or is it inside the bracket, outside the bracket? We don't have a name for that artist. We don't have a name for that particular individual. So it's not easy. It's a lot of hard, tedious work. As far as the deaf theater and the deaf artist, again, I finally came to the identity of me being deaf and was able at that point to clearly showcase that in my theatrical work. Now, I grew up in the oral method, and when I got involved with the IVT, I started signing and got rid of the oral method. I still have uh, what's inside of me in terms of my identity where I grew up in my childhood, but I used the signing method. Now, Patton. The author Patton says the deaf community and their signing, that belongs to their community. And so when I look at that, I see three different types of groups within the artist uh, community. And you can agree or disagree. The first one, those that got a name sign right here, it's the attractive artwork with the sign, sign language. The second one has no deaf culture involved. They're more uh, neutral. You know, I may support the deaf community, but I'm also an artist. And then you got others that are really activists. They're involved in the political side of things. So you've got three different ones. So there's three different groups I want to make sure we all understand. So for 30 to 40 years, you see this. You can see deaf studies. You can see the growth in, in the deaf uh, privilege, deaf gain, and then, of course, deaf hood. And you can see a lot of this in the artwork that's involved in this. So you've got deaf artists. You can see that here. You can see that with the performances and the mask. Or No, you can see the cat. The sign for bird is in free. With their sign for hand, the sign for freedom. You can see, well, it's the bird and you got the hand for freedom. Free bird, you can see that correlation. This is the deaf artwork. You can see the one on the left, that's the IVT performances, the signing of free from the chains. Betty Miller and Milan conference, the signing for Frida Betty Miller. And the next one, wow. Again, this is music. Well, the deaf people really didn't have the sound or the drums or anything like that, but it's musical in terms of the way they were signing. Do you see this piece? So how? How did they do this? Deaf people and write the, the music notes. Well, they I did some research and found out. So Victor, a deaf artist, we're very, very thankful to this individual later on. I think it was maybe 17 years. Yeah, I had not seen this particular piece. We compared what we have now to that. So it, this is the difference. Now, this particular piece, Joe Linnet, there was no music, so they were just writing out the music notes and the rhythm. Again, um, picturing a horse riding, as in writing the music notes, and the water, the beach, the sand, the seashore, the tides coming in and out. How do you write that, and then how do you sign it? And the rhythm, this is back in 81 or 86. This is the first dancing performance. Hearing people, they dance. We're not copying them. We're doing our own thing. We're coming up with our own dance, our own idea of how to do this and, and showcase our, 
or history that's involved within the dance. As far as workshops go and, and training and, and dancing and deaf people, there's a difference there. And it was really more of involving the body and the movement and the signing. And, and this is really something new that I got involved in. And this was from Sweden. You know, we had some deaf performers, three of them that came down. We learned about the music and we didn't want to necessarily copycat what the hearing were doing. We want to make sure we had our own different rhythm to all of this. In doing the research, deaf people, you know, PI means this is what is typical of someone. Deaf PI means this is the way deaf people would do it. This is their way. PI means it's typical of deaf people. So it's reading, language, artwork. You know, you didn't have a lot for the deaf community. This is the sign that we use where you didn't have a lot of that because the word really comes from the medical community where you look at the cells just like cancer begins to take on the host and begin to populate, multiply, which is the same idea. The hearing people kind of take over the deaf people. And we, we want that separation. We want to keep our own work and identity. And I would expect that Davia, the deaf artist, we would see more of this work and keep the separation from hearing people taking over. So it's important that you have a strong sense of your identity. If you're not clear one way or the other, so again, it's hard to really make a connection to the deaf artist unless you have that strong sense of identity. If you're oral and you're trying to, you know, unpack things and now, just like me, I have that identity and I'm, I, I'm, I have that connection to the deaf artwork. So you need to do that personal self-discovery first. Previously, as I really, as I look back, now today you see uh, the technological advancements. Back then you didn't have technology. You didn't have the, the texting capabilities. Again, the texting did not exist. Now you see everybody's kind of isolated today. Back in the day, everybody was strongly connected to a community. So now when I try to work, if I try to get involved with a group, but I'm isolated, I'm a part of the group, that's that's. That's difficult. It's the collectivism, the sharing of information is so important. You discuss the pros and the cons, right? And then you look at the economic side of things. Back then, you didn't have a lot of money. Things today are much more expensive, the high cost of living. And the deaf art work, we need to cherish that. We don't want to see that go by the wayside. Just like with the Native American community, you see some of their work and their history and heritage kind of going in decline. Then when you look at some other groups that have assimilated, again, the Native Americans, the indigenous people there in Australia, you see the same thing happening to them. You've got uh, the hearing people involved with deaf videos or hearing people that are signing in deaf videos. Again, it's not great. You've got famous actors or actresses, you know, but you now have deaf videographers and, and movie makers, and there's other things that are now starting to take place. And this particular movie, this film, something I was involved in, and it's about a deaf person uh, that did not want the hearing aid involvement. We looked at this for about four years, the arguments and those that were for or against the technology and looking at society's perspective and the deaf community's perspective. And again, this is in French, and so I'm so Obviously, born in the hospital, I knew, obviously, the child would be deaf because of genetics. We did not want a cochlear implant. Doctors would say, well, you know, you ought to consider this or that. You want to consider uh, a cochlear implant. I said, no, 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 no. Deafness, we're fine. We've got, uh, uh, you know, this person agreed, husband and wife, they do not want to have their child with a cochlear implant. And they're saying, well, you're deaf, you should have a cochlear implant. We're, we're telling them, no, it's enough, enough. And they're asking their opinion, their perspective. And you have your perspective as well. And then you can, you know, stay neutral. Doctors should remain neutral. They shouldn't try to force you to have a cochlear implant. This is another example. 
And of course, this is a film that you can look at and you can see what's yellow. Yellow is hearing, blue is deaf. Remember? Again, this was a heavy financial investment into this. And I have two favorites, the two on the bottom. Those are my favorite. And these two films really came out simultaneously. You can see the Bel Air. This person was really not popular, could not sign. You had this one actor. The boy on the end is deaf, the one on the very end. And the role was more of a supporting cast, not a, a leading role. And the BBC complained. They said, wait a minute, you don't have any deaf actors? Here, these hearing individuals cannot sign fluently, and they really criticized this particular film. And the other one that came out at the same time, this one, this is a sign name, same sign for money. This person's deaf blind, very well known, famous individual. Uh, just like you're familiar with Helen Keller, well, this individual's very famous. So, really, prior, before Helen Ke Keller came to fame, this person was really doing some research um, and obviously was involved with theater and they did research about deaf culture and deaf history and a lot of respect and, and reverence should be made uh, given to this individual. The other one, no, because they really marginalized the deaf individuals and they took over. You know, you had seven million people go watch this because you had this famous actor involved. You know, a deaf blind his historian, they didn't care. They just said, we want to look. The first one, uh, not so much. The second one, everybody. And, and you had the deaf actor. And so you had the 7 million people come. And so you had the recognition that was given. 7 million people watched that particular movie. So again, there's pros and cons to all this. Again, the festival, the different events. You can see that that's highlighted on this PowerPoint. What's the very first one? That one. 1989. De Villa. Formally recognized and established at the Deaf Way Conference in 1989. And this is a conference in France. Artists that were sharing their work. It's the same idea. You can see a parallel between what took place in America and in France. And then years later, you would see this in Brazil, a festival there in Brazil. Mm -hmm. That's their sign name there in Brazil. And now you've got there in Sweden, there at the top. And so in closing, in my personal observation, I look at the identity. I want to identify the important pieces of artwork. You see the Epe all the way until the identity begins to skyrocket. You see the blue. And then you see the decline from the Milan Conference of 1880. And then eventually the resurgence of deaf sporting events and organizations. You see that incline. And then sign language is uh, considered uh, outlawed, if you will, or, or taboo, rather. You see the decline, and then you see the establishment of the IVT and, and the growth, and what's going to happen with uh, genetics, and will they abort deaf children, and, and things of that nature. This is my last word that I want to share with you as you reflect and think about deaf culture. Do you want it to continue and remain robust? and grow in strength, but look at the political side of things, look at society's view, the technological advancements, will that cause uh, this to weaken? You have to think about all of this. And then leading up to until now, and then into the future, we really don't know what the future holds. So you need to contemplate that. So thank you so much.